And to some degree, a lot of this relates to processes such as calving, where we know very little about, and our models aren't very good at simulating calving processes. And in terms of Jakob's having, because this will apply later on in the talk, it counts for about a fifth of the mass loss from Greenland. So as a particular study case, it's exceptionally important. In terms of modeling glaciers, um, so I use Elmer Ice, which is an open source finite element model. And within that, you treat the flow of the glacier like a viscous fluid. So let's see. So this video here, you can see this is a glacier in Chile flowing from right to left, and you can see it moves in a fluid-like manner. And as a modeler, this is the closest that I'll get to a glacier. They only ever exist on my computer. Um, and so using um, a model such as Elmer, you can solve the, the flow and stress fields. And then using this information, you then want to predict calving, which is the breaking off of the icebergs on the front, as you see there. That's a sort of summary is what you aim to do when you're modeling a glacier. So there's an introduction to Elmer Ice. So like I said, Elmer Ice is an open source finite element model. It's capable of solving the full Stokes equations in 3D um, and therefore anything sort of related to that, whether that's stress, temperature, strain, etc. It's capable of massively parallel simulations. So this is um, when you, if you think about high performance computing, where you can run it uh, simultaneously on a large number of nodes or processes. Uh, within Elmer, there are a large number of mesh adaptation solvers, free surface solvers, um, inversion and adjoint solvers, as well, as well as multiple methods to read in the data. So why do we need a new um, calving algorithm in Elmer? There was previously a calving model in Elmer that was developed by Joe Todd, but it had two key limitations. The first of which, if you look at the mouse here, you'll see that these are the lateral corners and they were fixed in place. This means if the glacier advances or retreats, the front moves like a bowstring. You're constantly having it fixed in those two corners, which means if you get a large retreat, like all the way back here or a large advance, then the model would break down because it's really hard to um, remesh those edges. Um, it also relied on uh, calving front always had to remain projectable. Um, so this means that um, the, across the front, you couldn't have two nodes behind each other that had the same X coordinate. It also relied on an extruded mesh and within this sort of Elmer architecture, it relied on a set of command line calls for the remeshing, which obviously isn't ideal. So within this new algorithm, um, we've implemented um, full anisotropic remeshing using a module called MMG. And this allows the terminus to advance and retreat limitlessly. So we've no longer got that problem with our fixed margins. And it allows us for fully not, um, fully non-projectable calving. So you could calve any geometry of iceberg, both across the front um, and vertically. Um, because it uses this module MMG, it relies on a tetrahedral mesh, whilst historically Elmer's always used uh, a footprint um, that's then extruded vertically. And other features within this new algorithm are the calculation of the terminus advance, as long as as well as um, the calving, which is implemented in a level set or sign distance function. Um, but I'll talk about that later in more detail. And finally, um, because we're on high performance computing, um, there's um, what's known as rebalancing. And this is where um, you partition your mesh, so you break it up to, into wee bits, and um, you ensure that the computational cost of each section is roughly equivalent um, so it will run quicker on a high performance computer. So I'm just going to run through some of the, the model capabilities now. Um, so in terms of terminus advance, um, the terminus advance is purely Lagrangian across the front, except that these lateral margins here, it's prescribed along a predefined set of fjord boundaries. 
And you could solve this as a contact problem, but it would be computationally um, more expensive. Um, so instead, it was chosen to do this using these predefined fjord rails, if you like. Um, and this causes some mass loss, um, but it's pretty much insignificant, especially at a glacier the size of Jakobs Island. So you can see that in the simulation here, we've got a test case where the glacier is flowing from the top to the bottom, and then it's slowly going into a, a widening fjord. And you can see as well, the mesh is being remeshed at every time step, and the element quality remains pretty high. The model also has the capabilities um, to transfer um, elements between boundaries. So if you've got a narrowing fjord, then the front is going to hit that boundary before the lateral um, margin makes it round. So you're going to need to be able to transfer your elements between your boundaries. And if we look at that video again, you'll see that um, the, the nodes are evicting downwards. And I've recently, well, fairly recently, I've looked at um, making the full mesh Lagrangian apart from um, lateral boundaries here and the upflow boundary. Um, so this could potentially allow you to make the full mesh Grangian, um, which means you could potentially advect variables. So here's um, another um, case, and this shows you what happens when you've got a narrowing fjord. Here you've got the glacier flowing towards you, and then the fjord turns towards the right or the glacier's left. And if you look here, um, the, uh, the terminus advance and variable is only present on the front boundary. And you'll see the elements as they reach that fjord boundary are being transferred from the front boundary to the lateral boundary. This is really important when you think about calving because it's that lateral boundary that is giving you support to suppress calving um, through a compressive arch. But I'll talk about a bit about this later when we think about calving um, in winter readvanced cases. And then, of course, you've got front melting. Um, so you've got your front advance, and then from that, you can take away your melt, or you can have a stationary glacier where you're just applying melt to it. But it's a similar sort of architecture um, that it runs through. So here we've got an example again of a glacier flowing towards you. And there's a, a, a plume in the middle. I'll play that again. There's a plume in the middle here where you've got that strong melting. You've got some background melt around it, and you can see that this leads to substantial undercutting. And because the, the sort of uh, the main benefit of the algorithm is to do with the remeshing, etc., you can actually apply any sort of melt profile uh, both vertically and across the terminus. So, in terms of calving, um, currently implemented is the, the crevasse depth law. Um, so, this is um, where um, calving, oh, well, crevassing is assumed to occur where there's a, a longitudinal stress to openness. So in our case, that's where you've got um, the principal stress in the flow direction um, for surface crevasses that is greater than zero, or um, basal crevasses where the principal stress in the flow direction plus the water pressure is greater than zero. Um, so if you look at the image, then so these crevasses at uh, the surface, that's where the principal stress in the flow direction is stretching the glacier apart um, so greater than zero, and you assume that crevassing will happen there. And then um, calving will occur where either you get full thickness crevassing, as you potentially do in this case, or where surface crevasses meet the waterline depth, and then it's assumed hydrofracture um, will lead to calving. So from um, this calving law, we then want to predict um, where the calving will occur. So first of all, we solve the, the full stress field of the glacier. And then from that, using vertical ray casting, you then get, um, you project onto a, a 2D mesh the percentage of intact ice, or sort of opposite of um, the, the uh, penetration of full thickness crevassing. So you can see the blue area is where um, you, the model is predicted that full thickness calving, uh, crevassing could occur. And then from that, we then um, validate the crevasses, which I'll talk about on the next slide. But once you have 
um, your area that you uh, predict that calving is going to occur on your 2D mesh, this is translated into a level set variable, sign distance variable, um, from which um, the, the calving algorithm then implements the calving. So in terms of uh, crevasse validation, initially your, your crevasses are obviously assumed to occur um, along the, the um, zero contour, so where uh, full thickness crevassing is going to occur. But if you, if you look at this sort of theoretical image on the top right, you obviously are going to get bottlenecks, et cetera, um, within this method. So we need to validate the crevasses to assume that um, calving will only occur where the ice is capable of being evacuated. And when, when we do this, we can either um, add in the lateral margins, such as this case here, um, where, um, uh, where you validate your crevasses, um, you take um, account of your um, lateral margins or without. But it's very important to do this when you've got narrowing um, margins because it really suppresses and changes the calving. So like I said, currently it's the, the, the crevasse depth law is the only law implemented in 3D. But it's really important to establish the difference between the calving law and the calving algorithm. So the calving law is what enables you to predict calving. So what leads to this area where we think this area of blue ice is going to break off. And then the calving algorithm is the bit in the background that will then take this information on the left and convert it to a new domain with all your variables interpolated across. So actually, in terms of a lot of the work over the last two years has not been to do with the theoretical calving law or what we think causes calving, but actually the background architecture that allows you um, to implement calving in 3D with no limitations. And in this case, you'll see that the, the calving is purely vertical. And this is because that's a limitation of the, the calving law. Because if you think about full thickness crevassing, um, we're always assuming that crevasses are purely vertical and therefore full thickness calving has to be vertical. But this is not to say that the, the, cav the calving law is not a 3D calving law because um, when your front advex, um, we're obviously um, deforming the front um, in a 3D way. And this means that you are accounting for things like bending stresses, et cetera, that you're not capable of accounting for in 2D planar meshes. So the other thing that it's important to take account for is um, if a large calving event happens, such as the case on the left here, and in the real world, we know this leads to sort of almost instantaneous having further upstream. So as a way to be able to model this, we've added um, what you could call adaptive time stepping. So this is where if a large calving event such as this above a certain threshold occurs, then the time step of the model is reduced from days um, to milliseconds. And then this, the, the stokes and the, so the flow and the stress is rerun along with your um, calving law, see if having this, this, this change in geometry would lead to further calving upstream. And this sort of continues until um, there is no significant calving occurring, such as on the right-hand side here, um, from which um, the normal time stepping is resumed. And it's sort of important to note as well uh, that you can see non-projectable fronts here which wasn't previously possible. So sort of as, a, as an overview of when calving occurs and when it doesn't occur in the model, I'll try and sort of simplify this a bit. But um, within your um, calving model, um, the, there are times when you have to suppress the calving because the remeshing, which I'll talk about later, fails, or you want to um, change your time step. Um, so oh, I should have really put this slide later. Um, but 
Yeah, so occasionally our remeshing, which I'll talk about later, breaks down, and then therefore we have to um, suppress our calving. Um, so, I mean, this is just a flow chart showing um, the, the calving algorithm, um, and it's this remeshing bit I'm going to talk about on the next slide. Oh, not quite. Um, so, uh, yeah, your calving output, um, obviously, because we, we have the the geometry of the icebergs being calved, and um, we can uh, output this into a into a file and we give the the iceberg volume and the iceberg extent. Um, so it'll be I sort of next to this image from Samuel Cook's paper where he looks at um, icebergs breaking off the front store, and it'll be interesting to see how well um, the the model compares to the iceberg distribution. Um, observed at Jakobshaven. Okay, so in terms of, I've talked about um, predicting calving and the calving algorithm, but how does this look like in a typical simulation? So I'll just move everybody over to the left. So um, I previously talked about um, this adaptive time stepping. Um, so where you get a large calving event, um, we need to look further, uh, we need to reduce the time step and see if this leads to further calving upstream. So in terms of how this works, you, you solve your flow and stress, then your um, time dependent solvers, so these are the solvers that form your mesh, free surface um, and your front advance and melt. Um, so these are the solvers that we need to pause um, if calving occurs, because you obviously can't um, deform your mesh if you want to see if instantaneous calving occurs further upstream. So, um, first of all, obviously, if this was the first time step, you'd solve the flow of stress, you'd run all your um, independent solvers to your mesh deforming ones. These are the ones that allow the glacier to advance and simulate melt, etc. Um, you create calving. Um, if your remesh is successful um, and it's a large calving event, then um, we reduce the time step. Um, and it's important to note as well that we've modified the, the actual Elmer solver to add in time steps because say you set your, your um, simulation to run 100 days and you get five days where time is paused because you get these large calving events, you obviously will need to run 105 days to run um, your 100 day period. And it's also the other thing that you should know is technically the stoke should be solved twice. The stoke should be solved here. Um, if we were being really dantic, pause after um, you've formed your mesh, you ever so slightly have changed your domain. So you've affected your front two meters or something. Um, so technically you should solve it, but Realistically, it's unlikely to make a difference. And in any simulation involving full stokes, it's the solving of the stokes that takes up 95% of your computational time. So a really sort of simple way of looking at this is, I'll just move, is um, the, the first um, step is to solve your flow and stress field on the top left there. Then deform your mesh and your free surfaces. And these are the ones that, if the time step is paused, um, are, uh, are, are not done. Um, and then having is predicted to occur or not occur. And then there's the remeshing interpolation, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So I sort of tried to make the, the remeshing processes as simple as possible. But as you sort of could gather from the earlier slides, there are times where the remeshing breaks down and it leads to sort of complicated flowcharts um, where the, to make the model robust, we have to be able to um, we have to be able to deal with this. But essentially, you start with your distributed mesh. So if you think about um, each of these um, different colors of your mesh is related to one process in your um, computer. And so um, you then, the first step of the remeshing 
is to align the edge elements along that zero um, level set contour. So if I go back one slide, you see that this is where you've got your level set. And so the zero contour is this line here, where negative values are what's being calved and positive, positive values are the remainder of the glacier. So we align elements, edges along that um, zero contour, then remove any elements that have a negative level set value, the elements in front of the new front. We then do a secondary remeshing step um, to improve the quality of the mesh. And then we rebalance um, the mesh. So this is again, where you redistribute all these little partitions, make sure that they're computationally similar um, so that your um, simulation can run um, as efficiently as possible. And then finally, um, in parallel, we interpolate all the variables from this first mesh across onto the second mesh. But it's important to note that a lot of um, uh, sort of interpolation of the variables is just for show because a lot of the important variables are recalculated from scratch um, next time step. So any potential um, interpolation problems um, are sort of not as significant as what you think. So in terms of the, the, the remeshing algorithm in Elmer, um, we've implemented um, parallel remeshing, adaptive parallel remeshing, which for glaciology could be used, for example, um, if you've got a moving boundary between your temperate ice or cold ice. Um, and this is useful for any, well, glaciological or engineering problem that requires adaptive remeshing. If you look at the video on the bottom left, you've just got a simple advection across your x-axis and you can see the fine resolution of the mesh follows it across. And again, the video on the right, this is just showing you on four processes where each of these colors is again your partitions um, showing that it's happening in parallel. And this has been released on the Elmer GitHub page, but I know the, the Elmer guys at CSC in Finland are actively um, trying to develop this further um, to make it more useful for glaciological purposes. So it, sort of to summarize the, the capabilities of the new algorithm before we move on to um, the application, this new algorithm allows unlimited retreat in advance of the glacier, um, unrestricted calving, and I've shown you the example with um, the crevasse depth calving law. But if you have a calving law that um, could um, produce a level set surface, it could be implemented um, fairly easily. Um, and then there is potential for features or variables to be evicted downstream with a fully Lagrangian mesh. And then um, any melt uh, field could be applied to the front of the glacier. So within the retreat and advance, um, you could apply any melt um, to the glacier. And uh, Elmer does actually have plume solvers, et cetera, that it could be easily coupled with. So finally on to some application. So in terms of initial application um, at Jakobshavn, um, so to test the robustness of the model, um, we applied it in summer 2017 and winter 2016. If you look in the bottom right, you'll see so the, annoyingly, this uh, graph is sort of backwards where you've got um, advances downwards and retreat is up. You'll see there was a large winter re-advancement and then a, a significant um, summer retreat. So this is a sort of two good periods to test whether the model can simulate retreat and can simulate advance. And so um, here is Jakobshavn and the, the black line is the model domain and then the, these red lines are the rails. So where model could potentially advance along. Um, we did a, a spin-up, which was um, uh, based off an initial um, guess of the um, friction on the bottom. We did a steady state temperature spin-up followed by an inversion. So this is where you um, make your sort of best estimation of the, of the basal conditions um, 
as you try and match them, uh, match the model surface conditions to the observed uh, surface velocity conditions to the observed velocity conditions. And then we relaxed the model um, for a couple of years to remove out any potential errors from the digital surface elevation models. So in terms of application in the summer, and um, this started in May um, 2017 and ran to the 9th of August. And um, so a hundred day period. And so this image on the right is a satellite image from the end of that period. And you can see the, the real life term, this is roughly around here where the mouse is. And then each of these lines represents the terminus position from a particular model drawn. So the, the purple line is the start position for each model. And then if we run a simulation with an unaltered calving law, um, Glacier actually advances to this blue line, which is obviously not the case in the real world. So where calving was clearly underestimated, um, and this is hard to know if it's because we aren't including certain processes um, like male undercutting or um, whether it's to do with the calving law, missing processes not captured in the calving law. But to provide a better estimation, we altered the calving law. So we reduced the percentage of um, vertical crevassing required to induce calving. So if you look at the green line, which is 90, that's where if 90% of the ice column was crevassed, that would lead to calving. And the, the best estimation was this orange line, which was 82.5%, which um, followed the terminus quite nicely. But importantly, if you look at the 80% the this red line, where you've got a runaway retreat, it's important to note that this showed the model was robust enough to be able to um, model significant tens of kilometers of retreat in one season. Um, so this is just a wee video showing um, what um, a 3D calving model actually looks like. And this is the, the 82.5% um, simulation. And you'll see, like any glacier, you've got periods of retreat and then periods of advance even across that summer season. And you'll notice um, towards the end when you get significant calving, um, you get um, corresponding velocity. Oh, oh no, you get corresponding velocity increases across the front there. So in terms of application at the winter, um, so from a technical point of view, this was much more challenging um, because as I'll explain on the next slide, there were lots of problems related to Lagrangian movement at the lateral margins. But we finally got it to a stage where we're happy with it. And so again, if you look at this image on the right, this is from the end of that winter period, which was 138 simulation. And you'll see, although it's hard to say because there's a thick melange, that the actual front is roughly around here. Um, and again, the, the purple line represents the start of the simulation, and then the red line is at the end of the simulation. And you'll see that we managed to simulate the glacier motion pretty well. And so that was the main thing, to show that the model was robust enough to be able to simulate both rapid winter, uh, rapid summer retreat and winter re-advancement. And so now we need to sort of be able to put those two things together and be able to simulate a whole season. I'm just going to talk about the problems with the Lagrangian motion um, in the winter first. So if we watch this video here, you notice the glacier advancing. And because you've got much lower velocities at the lateral margins, you get sort of almost bulging. And then as you just before, um, just before the, the nodes reach that lateral margin, where they can transfer boundary conditions, um, it leads to a calving event, as you can see here. So you get a calving event here. And this is sort of a bit of a problem because if you end up with calving in the lateral margins, it, because you're not getting that lateral buttressing, it prevents your um, complete winter re-advancement. And um, so if we look at this image on the right, if, so. The red line is where I think the glacier is actually, is where the 
lateral margin elements are. And then beyond here is, is the rail. And so your glacier is almost effectively reaching your fjord wall from which elements would then transfer um, to your lateral margin and provide um, that lateral buttressing um, to your model. But the, the calving occurs just before this because you're time stepping and your Lagrangian movement is moving across and um, you effectively end up with this area of ice that's completely unsupported on just before it reaches the lateral margin and it calves. But in the real world, if this area here was to calve, it's within one or two meters of the lateral margin, it would jam into that lateral margin. So the only way that we could simulate um, winter re-advancement properly is to suppress calving if the depth of the iceberg, and by depth, I mean interior depth, not vertical depth, if the interior depth was greater than the distance to the fjord wall uh, in the direction of the evacuation, um, then calving would be suppressed. Because in the real world as well, your um, shear margins here um, would be so broken up that they, it's hard to model them as a viscous flow anyway. Um, so this is the sort of best solution we could come up um, with to this problem. And it's the only one that I spent many months working on this. And this is the one solution that we could come up with that would um, allow uh, full winter readvancement. Okay. So in terms of current simulations, um, so currently I'm running simulations from October, 2016. Uh, to summer 2017. So that's that full period. And the challenge there is to allow your winter re-advancement and then be able to simulate um, your summer retreat. But there are several um, factors that we want to investigate um, to see what affects um, calving. And the first being the basal conditions. I'll talk about that in the next slide. And then we've got some data of, of uh, plume melting um, across the front of Jakobshavn, and then to see what effect the strength and longevity of the ice melange has on both the winter readvancement and the, the summer calving. And once we include all these factors, um, it'll be interesting to see how much we need to change the sensitivity of the calving law to be able to match um, real world results. So in terms of um, changing basal slip conditions, so usually when you, when you run a, a simulation, you do one inversion. So this is where you um, predict, well, you estimate the basal conditions and you do this on the initialization of the model and then you just don't think about it again. So we were interested to see if we used monthly maps based on, um, so to produce each monthly map, you get the glacier geometry, that particular month, based off the sort of posi uh, terminus position data, we'd get the uh, random x velocity data. We then do initial inversion and a, a, a steady state temperature spin up, and then from this we would produce our basal map for that particular month. And um, we're interested to see if this, um, using basal map, uh, like using a basal uh, monthly map rather than using one map on the initialization of the model will lead to changes in the uh, calving behavior at Jakobshavn. And I've just spotted here that the mean um, uh, beta, which is um, related to the, the, the friction coefficient on the bottom. And you'll see that I was expecting that it would just sort of Generally increase to, to winter where we'd have a winter high spot and then um, summer conditions where you get basal channels, etc., cetera, um, and a lot more melt, you'd have a lot more slip on the bottom. It doesn't seem to show that seasonality. So I need to sort of look into this a bit more. What is noticeable is if the calving front at Jakob's Haven has moved significantly during between months, you, for example, between January and February, then the get a large change in the basal conditions. So this is probably a sort of model artifact rather than a real world um, problem. 
And then in terms of melt, um, we've got plume and ambient melt um, um, profiles from this paper, which is in the cryosphere discussions at the minute. And so this is, they've done an MIT GCM simulation um, for the whole of Yakovsavin Fjord. And from that, they've given us their profiles um, for the season. And interestingly, one of, they've done MIT GC um, simulations with and without icebergs. And interestingly, one of their conclusions, the main conclusions in their paper, is that um, with icebergs, you get um, much lower um, plume penetration into the upper water column. And they predict that this leads to more undercutting and therefore more calving. So with our 3D model, we're in a sort of position to be able to test this. And it'll be interesting um, to see how this, um, whether this alters calving at all. Um, but yeah, so we, we can apply these melt profiles um, across um, the full simulation changing monthly. And so this is just, uh, just showing you the first month and a half of a simulation where you can see the main plume in the center there. Um, and then so I should play that again. So the main plume in the center with some background melt around it. The plume actually leads to undercutting, which leads to that significant calving event in the middle. And then as you move from October to November, the plume uh, becomes less significant and the melt reduces a lot. So um, the other um, thing that we want to look at is this um, changing ice melange backstress. And so ice melange backstress has always been applied as a simple non-coupled backstress. And we use um, a value of 75 kilopascals, which is similar to what Joe Todd used at store. And this is applied to the top 100 meters of the glacier. And when I started my PhD, I was originally going to look at melange dynamics and how they relate to calving. But it's very difficult to be able to couple melange dynamics with calving um, because um, the, the granular form of melange makes it impossible to be able to include in a sort of fully coupled model um, with your glacier model. So instead, we're, we're left in these situations where we just have a binary backstress that is either on or it's off. But even then, it should provide us with a good estimation of whether uh, a, a long lasting melange throughout the winter potentially can affect um, calving in the summer or not. So we're applying it from the 1st of November um, to the 1st of May. And then putting all of this together, um, so whether the melange, the, the plume melting and the basal conditions, it'll be interesting to see when we include all of these new variables, how much we'll then need to choose, uh, tune our new calving or uh, our calving law, and whether we'll need to adapt it and reduce the, the percentage of the vertical ice column required to induce calving. So I don't have a video of um, known access because it's pretty boring, it's just on or off. So I thought I'd just show a video of the surface mass balance which changes daily, just to sort of give you an idea of, sort of how complicated some of the data is in terms of um, the changing boundary conditions in the model. So I've started, I've been running these simulations for a week now, and I sort of, I started getting my first results today. So unfortunately, I, I can't really share them with you, but it's sort of a, a big relief having spent three years developing an algorithm or a model for my PhD that with a couple of months left, I finally got some results. So fingers crossed I'll actually be able to get a PhD. Um, so I thought I'd sort of finish um, with a sort of summary of where I think we are with 3D modeling, because, uh, well, uh, modeling 3D calving, because it's not very common. Most ice sheet models are all 2D planar. Um, and even in the, the, the new, calving model into comparison, I think everything else just seems to be um, uh, 2D um, planar models. So there's been limited application of, of calving in 3D in continuum. Um, 
So Joe and, 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 and Samuel Cook have applied at the store, and this is the sort of first application that Jakob's having, where you've got significant sustain, retreat, and advance. Um, Samuel Cook's model, he developed a, a coupled model with a GLADS basal hydrology model, um, coupled with the old calving algorithm. So that allows you to have changing basal conditions and changing plume dynamics based on the hydrology model. This new calving model allows unrestricted calving in both iceberg geometry and terminus retreat. And the new remeshing techniques developed in this model um, allow advection of variables. And with Dorothy Velo as part of the Dominoes project, we're trying to advect physically inserted crevasses in 3D at Thwaites Glacier. But in terms of the, so we've come a long way in terms of the, the, the architecture of the Elmer Ice model, but in terms of the things we're lacking, um, Melange, is all, as I said, is always just a binary boundary condition. And there's lots of papers saying how important Melange is and how it relates to calving, but it's never been modeled well with a calving model. And another thing is we've only got one calving law that we've implemented in 3D. I have looked at other calving laws um, that are established in um, 2D planar models, um, but it's, none of them have converted well um, to 3D full stokes. So it looks as if for a lot of things, we've got the, the model architecture to move forward, but conceptually um, there's certain things about calving processes that we don't really know and aren't very well established. So thanks for listening. Um, uh, prepare to answer any questions. And if you're interested in using the model, then feel free to get in touch. Um, it'll be, when I finish my PhD, it'll be released on the, the Elmer Ice um, uh, GitHub repository, but I'm happy to, to give it to people beforehand. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks Ian, yeah, that was great. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions? Okay, we have a couple of questions from Klaus in the chat. Um, Klaus, are you interested in uh, uh, asking them? Or uh, we can just read them out. <laughs> I, I think it would be simplest if uh, Ian would read them or plainly answer them. Uh, and yeah. So yeah, as in, so this is one of the things that if I had more time that I'd I'd want to look into more. Um, so the the rheology of ice is is constant in terms of critical strength, um, and because we're using this this Nye based criterion, you're, the the where the crevasses are conceptually occurring is. Um, recalculated every time step. So there's no memory within that system. But that was one of the things that if I had more time, I was, I was really interested in, in looking at because I could make the mesh Lagrangian, I could potentially advect areas of damaged ice um, and see if that affects calving, which I'm sure it does. And I think that is one of the big reasons, um, having talked to Samuel Cook as well, that we think that the, the calving law underestimates calving because there's no, we haven't come up with any way to include ice history within the model yet. In the presence of any uh, debris in the ice, would that potentially in your guess uh, influence or include possible anisotropies depending on the geometry of it? Um, potentially, but I think the, the, the biggest thing is that if you look at the front of these glaciers, they're so heavily crevassed that the, the, the sort of large scale ice strength is going to significantly change, I think. And um, although we can incorporate temperature and things like that, I think if we could incorporate what's sort of colloquially known as damage, that would be sort of the big next step forward. Thanks. No worries.
Any other questions? <laughs> Uh, well, well, I was kind of wondering um, about uh, like what kinds of observations might help um, improve your model or test it or help constrain things better. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good question because because effectively with a continuum model, you're never going to be able to replicate fracture exactly. You're never going to be able to replicate an individual calving event like you could in a sort of high den discrete element model. So you're always trying to replicate sort of calving styles. Um, so in terms of sort of what I presented today, I think it's just trying to be able to replicate terminus positions over time. But I, I was hoping to, for the sort of final um, sort of bit of my PhD, look at, um, sort of two week snapshot where we've got some TRI data from the front of Jakobshaven and see if um, we can simulate calving on a much shorter time scale where potentially um, calving responds more uh, viscoelastically or elastically rather than purely as a viscous process. But it's, yeah, it's hard because the other thing we don't know anything about is what the calving front looks like below the waterline. So, because we, we always assume it's vertical, but you've got no idea what, what it's like. Because if that was undercut, we'd lead to massively more calving. So that kind of relates to the, the 3D uh, capability of your model, like, uh, I guess, like how much, does that impact the overall results? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's, it impacts it massively, um, but it's hard to know but as well, because the other thing apart from sort of ice damage history that we don't know very much about tidewater glaciers is we don't know really much about plume melting in terms of what range is normal for plume melting. It's from observations, and therefore sort of models. Um, so you've got, it's very hard to know how much undercutting is realistic because you could almost tune your model without tuning the calving law by just tuning the melt, the plume melt. So yeah, that's another sort of big unknown at the minute. Ian, great presentation. Um, I was wondering if, if you and Thomas ever did chat about other ways to implement melange instead of that binary backstress that's uniform across the calving front, has there been any ideas kicking around? Mm, no, not that I, I, no, no, I think it's more just the only thing that I thought was potentially you could base it off your calving so you could have some function based off calving history um, and seasonality um, because but then it's hard to know if melange breaks up because of calving or calving happens because the melange breaks up the chicken so, and the egg question yeah yeah it's it's hard to know but I, I think it'd be nice to even just do a simulation where you've got more of sort of erratic melange even if it's just manually prescribed to see if that does make a difference or because it might not make a difference because on those year long simulations where you're purely simulating the viscous flow, the, the breakup of the launch for a day might not actually make a difference. Maybe it's only if you're modeling calving in viscoelastic or elastic, mm -hmm. where, where it, because the, the maximum time for Jakob's calving is probably a day. So it's sort of on the edge of whether it'd actually make a difference. Maybe that's a nice place to start doing some setting up some experiments like that after your PhD. After. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whatever you'd like. Anyways, we'll talk. Thanks, Ian. Okay. Are there any more questions? Uh, we're getting close to noon, so. <laughs> Okay.
Okay. Well, I guess we can stop here. So, thanks again, Ian. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me.